I am recording. Awesome. Should maybe someone else's as well, but there's me. So a couple of things that uh, Dr. Trant mentioned people would be interested in hearing about was a bit more information on drawing. Um, it's a very British accent. Um, um, <laughs> OK, uh, so. Just maximize that. So the things that Dr. Tram mentioned that you might want to hear about were more, more about drawing stick diagrams and then we'll talk about some electronegativity or we can do it the other way around or we can do something else. Um, does anyone have any particular questions they'd like to start us off with or shall I just start about drawing molecules? OK, looks like uh, we're drawing molecules. Uh, excuse uh, me. Resonance uh, is something that Dr. Tran is actually covering in his next lecture, I think. But well, if you would like to talk about that, I am certainly happy to do uh, once we've covered some electronegativity because it will be helpful to do first. Someone said drawing, so I will uh, do drawing. And if you're having trouble with Spartan, I think Dr. Icorn is in charge of that. Um, I'm just glad to say that I am not. Um, so the thing that we are doing in terms of drawing molecules, the big emphasis really is stop drawing them like this, uh, partly because um, it is just going to take you too long to do anything. And of course, it really does misrepresent well, the shape of the molecule that we're interested in. Thanks. OK, so just don't do this. OK, because it really doesn't show the 3D structure of the molecule. What we're trying to do when we're drawing line shapes um, for molecules is, yes, abbreviate things to make them um, quicker to draw, but also in some respects make them more accurate. OK, so one of the things that we don't draw is draw 90 degree bonds because bonds are not 90 degrees. Um, there are some bonds in inorganic chemistry that appear to be 90 degrees, but within organic chemistry, we're really looking at um, three different bond angles. OK, we're looking at. The bond angle for. Something like methane, which is hello, cool. I'm just going to redraw it. Hello. Uh, shoot, you can finally hear me. Yeah, I can. Um, hello. What's yeah, up? I've been trying to figure things out for a while. Uh, so I'm pretty sure Dr. Tran actually wanted us to focus on resonance today, but that's uh, at least not I heard. what he told me half an hour ago. Oh, but I okay. will. I will talk about it if you want. Oh, uh, um, sure. Maybe towards yep. the end of the lecture then. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, you don't have access to this PowerPoint, um, but I will upload it mainly because I put it together about an hour and a half ago. Um, so in a standard tetrahedral molecule, or a standard tetrahedral atom rather, the bond angle here is about 109.5 degrees, and it's sometimes referred to as the tetrahedral angle. Um, when you have an atom that has sp2 hybridization, which I think you're coming to as well in the next lecture. Um, then the bond angle here is 120 degrees. And when you have something that we refer to as being SP hybridized, where you've got a triple bond, the bond angle there is 180. So whenever we're trying to draw things with line structures, what we're trying to do is represent those more accurate bond angles. OK, and we can also add in stereochemistry and by stereochemistry, stereo essentially is talking about shape and three dimensionality. So this bond goes back into the paper, so we draw it as hashed as to say that it's going away from us and then we draw this wedge to say it's coming towards us. What can we say? Um, organic chemistry is a bit of an art class as well. Um, so yeah, this one's coming towards us. So this is butane. Um, and the better way to draw it, firstly, oops, 
too many clicks. Um, you could draw it like this. That is a much better, more accurate representation of what butane looks like. Though it, of course, is also in motion and there's rotations and things like this. But it also takes a long time to draw that comparatively. Much easier to do stick figures like this. OK, the key thing there is that it is representing all the same things. And in particular, it's representing the bond angles. We're just drawing in these bonds. OK, so we're still showing this approximately 109 degrees angle. We're still showing that here. 109.5 degrees, I said. Um, properly, it's 109 degrees, 28 minutes, but 109.5 is good enough. OK, and then at the end. This is a CH3 group and any just angle is a CH2. OK, so some easy rules and again, I will get to Dr. Trant to upload this to um, uh, Blackboard for you. These are just some easy rules. Draw chains of atoms as zigzags with 120 degree angles approximately to show their shape. Miss out all of the capital C's representing carbon atoms. Miss out the H's attached to carbon atoms along with the CH bonds. Draw in everything else. OK, um, in organic chemistry, we really just focus on carbon so much. But carbon is the backbone. It doesn't really do anything. It just supports everything else upon it. So we put on the functional groups, the alcohols and all this kind of thing. Um, and everything else is implied. OK. In the occasion that you drew, do draw a carbon atom in, draw everything else around it. But most of the time, um, that is a very big if. So just to give you an example, if we look at propanol or one propanol, uh, sometimes it's called propan one ol sometimes it's called one propanol. So propane, does anyone remember how many carbons um, is in propane? Three, thank you. So we just draw a zigzag of two. The one, oh, pardon me. The one, we're just going to label one, two, three. And that tells us there's an ol. So which functional group is an ol? Does anyone remember? OH. Oh, yeah, thank you. Alcohol, OH and alcohol. So we're just going to say that at the one position we draw in an OH. So that's one propanol. My handwriting is just as bad as Dr. Trant's. My apologies in advance. Um, so propan 2 ol tells us it's going to go on the second atom. So we draw our zigzag. Oh, sorry, when I touch the screen, it's just a little bit too sensitive. Those are just the ways that we do it. You can probably imagine that as molecules get a lot more complicated. This gets rough. So like I was saying before, you want to show in when you've got double bonds that it's really 120 degrees. You've got cis and trans isomers of double bonds, cis when they're the same, trans when they're opposite. And then when you've got a triple bond, they are linear. When you've got cyclohexane, we normally just draw it as a as a hexagon and benzene. We also draw as a hexagon, but with these double bonds in them. And because of resonance, we'll get to that in a minute, we sometimes draw it as a hexagon with a ring in the middle. OK, you can probably imagine that these molecules, to be honest, this wouldn't be horribly difficult to draw. Um, if you wanted to, but it is so much quicker to just do that. Oh dear, pen's being difficult today. Try that again. So much quicker, so much easier, and is meant to convey the same information. For simple molecules like this, drawing either structure would be 
kind of understandable, but when we get to more complicated molecules like these, you can imagine you'd spend half of your exam drawing these things. Um, especially some beasts like this one. Don't know if anyone knows this one, but uh, this is a molecule called Lipitor. Um, and um, this was one of the major drugs. Pfizer made something like $15 billion a year for about 10 years with this one. It's fantastic. Um, and they've made quite a lot of money out of that one as well. Um, OK. That's a very brief overview um, to um, how you draw things. And I will definitely go over benzene. Um, so when we're talking about benzene, so and I'm going to draw it as a plain cycle uh, hexagon. Try and actually draw up everything. Um, and we draw it with three double bonds in it. OK, the thing is, although we can draw it like this, this is referred to as the Kekulé structure. Um, this is what um, Kekulé envisaged. Apparently he had a dream and woke up. Uh, he had a, he imagined a snake biting its own tail and, and he realized that there was a ring going on. I don't know exactly what he was smoking prior to going to sleep, but you know, we can probably guess. Um, but the problem is we can draw these double bonds in these atoms, which I'm going to just label one, two, three, four, five, six. But I've drawn a double bond between carbons one and two, two, uh, sorry, one and six, two and three, and four and five. But I could equally reasonably draw oops, double bonds between one and two, three and four, and five and six. And these are the exactly same things. Um, OK. Sorry. Sorry if people are confused. Somebody wants another example. The CH3 and the CH2s. OK. So the end of any chain that we're drawing is going to be a CH3. OK. So the end of a chain is a CH3. Anything in the middle of a chain is a CH2. OK, so let's think of a molecule. Um, if we have. I'm going to call this one. Uh, sorry. Just need to get some clear space. OK. So I'm going to call this molecule 2-methyl. Two 2-methyl two propane. Propane tells me that there's three carbons in the longest chain. And two tells us that in atom two, we're going to put a methyl group. OK, and a methyl group is just another line like that. Now, the way that we could draw this, if we're going to be more explicit, is we could say H3C, so a methyl group. CH, CH3. These two things are meant to contain the same information. OK, because the end of the chain is a CH3. But the middle of a chain is going to be a CH2 unless there's something else on it. Does that make sense? Trying not to confuse anyone anymore. OK. 
Somebody got it. Okay, at least as long as one person has been enlightened and I've done my job, right? Okay. Kekulé structure of benzene. There are two equivalent structures. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you, Mohammed. I'm glad you're OK. <laughs> so because we have two equivalent structures here, we don't have any good way of saying which one is best. So the way that this was originally interpreted was that these are flipping backwards and forwards between these two. OK. Essentially, the bonds are moving so fast that we can't actually see any difference between these two. And so rather than actually saying that this, I'm just going to change color here, rather than saying that this is a double bond and this is a single bond, instead what we're saying is that it seems to average out somewhere in between the two. Okay, they're flipping backwards and forwards so fast. Um, that they average out about one and a half bonds. And this can be represented like this. Essentially, we say that we draw drop dotted bonds because there's a solid bond showing a full bond and the dotted bond being the half, okay? So essentially, when you add these two things together, you get this. And often this is more simply represented as a hexagon with a ring in the middle. OK, so when we're talking about resonance. What we're saying is that there are multiple structures. Uh, Lewis structures, if you will. that contribute that contribute to the real structure and this real structure is sometimes called the resonance hybrid OK, because it is a hybrid of all those individual structures added together. Yes, that is why the figure has a circle, because it's just a quicker way than drawing lots of dotted bonds. Any more questions about resonance? It get it's a very deep hole to go down. Um, but there are a lot of but the, the very simplest thing is that there are multiple possible Lewis structures and the way that we typically represent Lewis structures is as we showed on the previous few slides um, as a single bond, a single line. Remember that, that single line essentially has a dot and a cross. Uh, so for that, dot cross is our Lewis structure, but we don't usually put in those electrons because we know, or at least we're used to knowing, that a single line represents a single a pair of electrons as a bonding pair. OK. And I yes, uh, this should be chapter one and two is my understanding. Ah, there's a good question, Dondra. Dondra? Dondra, yeah. Um, so acetic acid is interesting, OK? Um, so, oh, what happened there? Too many slides.
OK, so. In acetic acid. Or ethanoic acid. OK, so we can draw it as. That's the old way of drawing it. Um, I believe drawing resonance structures is in future lectures, yes. Now, acetic acid doesn't really have two equivalent um, resonance structures while it is in the acid form. OK, when it is in the anion form, it does. OK, so when it acts like an acid and donates the H plus, if we're thinking of the Bronsted definition, then we get H plus. And we get. This. OK. Now, the oxygen of this carbonyl group obviously has two electrons here and two electrons here, so we've got two lone pairs. Now that this O minus has a negative charge on it, it had its original two lone pairs, but we're now giving it another two lone, another two electrons because the bond to the H is no longer there. OK. So we can draw the resonance structure. Like this. OK. So this is. Uh, Yazan asked about this, but um, yes, this counts as another example of where a resonance structure isn't benzene. These two are equivalent structures, and when you add these two things together, what you end up with is a new resonance hybrid. OK, and what this is showing is that the negative charge isn't only on one oxygen. OK, there is essentially a half negative charge. On each of the oxygens. OK, this is primarily. Yes, Julia, Julia, there we are. Yeah, um, this is most important when it is an anion. Um, the H plus, if it's acted um, as an acid, the H plus has dropped off and protonated something else. So it's still around, absolutely. Um, but the carboxylate anion is flipping backwards and forwards between these two, that this is actually the proper pairing, if you like, OK, in this blue box. That's what it really looks like when the H plus drops off. When it is the anion. Yeah, so. If you imagine. Um, that <coughs> pardon me. That the anion is on this structure 50% of the time and 50% of the time the negative charge is on the top oxygen. Then in actual fact it's shared over both oxygens. And because these oxygens are exactly the same. There is no difference as to why it would prefer one to the other, so it is equally shared between these two. OK. There is a molecular orbital picture that explains this that actually shows that the negative charge doesn't move. It's always shared between the two of them. The dipole moment is complicated. Um, so the dipole moment for this bond goes in this direction because the oxygen pulls the electron density. 
it pulls in this direction because oxygen also pulls. So when you add those two together, then the dipole moment for the molecule is like the dark red arrow there. Yes, the half represents that the charge is spread over each of those things equally. Now you can either draw one of these Lewis structures and leave the negative charge on just one oxygen, or you can show it as the resonance hybrid. OK, so the structure that I drew in purple is that resonance hybrid. OK, when you have two atoms that are not the same. Then the hybrid is not going to be perfect and the charges are going to be distributed unequally. OK, now how we determine where the charges are. Oh, Ooh, it's a good question, Mohammed. Um, this actually comes down to a question of hybridization state. OK, so the hybridization state of the carbon and remember it's the carbon that's essentially causing the oxygens to stick out. The carbon doesn't actually change anything, doesn't change. It's still around 120 degrees. There's no big difference. If anything, to be honest, the the chart, the I mean, the bond angle will be about 120 uh, at the start. If anything, it might get a little bit bigger just because the negative charges repel each other a bit. But to a first approximation, I would say it does not change. OK. Any particular questions about drawing structures, drawing Lewis structures and resonance structures? Because the next thing I was going to talk about is. Oh. Couple more random examples, OK. Um. Right. So. Here's a an example. So. In the amino acid histidine. You have this structure. OK, and this structure is called an imidazole. And um, if anyone has allergies um, and you take antihistamines, it's trying to block a molecule that's unsurprisingly called histamine, and histamine is that. But I'll not talk about histamine. I'm going to talk about imidazole. Now this molecule can act. This molecule definitely has more resonant structures. So in this um, compound, imidazole can act as a base. OK, so some acid is around and it is offering an H plus. And the lone pair of this nitrogen can donate towards this H plus. And we get. this now this nitrogen has donated electrons towards the h plus so we still have a charge which is now on this nitrogen uh somebody just stuck their hand up christoph was it Oh, 
Okay, not seeing anything again. Okay, so in this case, we now have a molecule that looks kind of symmetrical with a positive charge. So I'm now going to draw another structure, a resonance structure of this molecule. So you can see now, OK, no worries, Christian. Um, some uh, but all this came from some magical acid. If you like, we could even say. Um, let's say that acetic acid was doing it. So let's say that we've got acetic acid around. It reacts with imidazole and that generates our anion and now our cation. OK, and this cation, I've moved the positive charge from the right hand nitrogen in the left hand structure to the left hand nitrogen in the right hand structure. So when we put these two things together, the resonance hybrid because these two are equivalent, we essentially have a half positive charge here and a half positive charge here because we can show that the electrons move backwards and forwards. Um, symmetry is not a prerequisite, but it helps. I'm using symmetrical examples because it means that I can say quite happily that the charge is equally balanced between these two things. There is indeed a lone pair on the nitrogen. Yeah. So we can move backwards and forwards here. Uh, this is uh, answer question. The reason that I'm doing the half exactly half is because the charge is going to be evenly split by symmetry. OK, because it's a symmetrical molecule, there is no difference between these two things. If we had a non symmetrical molecule, then the charges would not be perfectly even. There wouldn't be half and half. It might be uh, two thirds, one third. It depends on the rest of the structure of the molecule. I'm giving you very simple examples so that we can have a simpler discussion than something more complicated. Um, that's a really good question, Ali. Yes, the positive charge does delocalize further around, but it is primarily based on the nitrogen. That's absolutely right. The requirement for resonance is that electrons can shift around, which means we're looking at double bonded systems. So any kind of double bonds. So when we're looking at um, double bonds and charges, lone pairs, positive charges, the general topic is usually referred to as conjugation. OK, resonance is a more is like a subset, but when you have double bonds and triple bonds and positive charge and negative charges all flying around, we usually refer to them as being conjugated. And yes, this molecule can have a lot of resonance structures. I am drawing the two major ones. Um, so here's a very good question. Um, yes, I will do a non symmetrical example. So. Let's just say instead of acetic acid, I have acetamide. OK. Now. 
I can take take some base. Let's say that we have um, sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide can then take remove this hydrogen from the nitrogen. This then gives me oops, And the nitrogen had a lone pair on it to start. The oxygen had a, two lone pairs. And now because we've got the negative charge, nitrogen has a second lone pair on it. OK, now I can also draw a resonance structure. This double headed arrow, by the way, is where we show that two resonance structures are interconverting. Um, so these are not symmetrical now. Which do you think is the more important of the two? Which one do you think can hold on to the negative charge better and why? And I can wait here as long as you like. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, oxygen because it's more electronegative. So that's the major one. Ah, everyone's saying it. Excellent. Sorry, Alyssa. No, it's about the electronegativity. So oxygen. And when we say it's more electronegative, it's just a simple way of saying it wants electrons more. So when you create a resonance hybrid from these two put together, we have a delocalized system. We've got electrons moving backwards and forwards between um the oxygen and the nitrogen but and i do not have an exact number for you here which let's not even pretend to try i'm just going to say that there is a partial negative which we usually refer to as a delta negative on the oxygen there and a smaller partial negative on the nitrogen So it's not symmetrical. The oxygen will be the major contributor to this. But there is still delocalization. Does that make sense? So speaking of electronegativity, let's talk about electronegativity for a minute, maybe more than a minute. Ah, perfect timing. How about that? Very next uh, slide. So the simplest way to describe electronegativity um, and anyone that's in uh, inorganic chemistry with Dr. Drover will probably see this exact slide either later this week or uh, next week. Is that electronegativity is the ability of an atom within a molecule to attract electrons to itself. And electronegativity is sometimes given the symbol chi. And the key thing to notice is that electronegativity increases from left to right across the periodic table and decreases from top to bottom. OK, and what we normally consider the most electronegative atom is fluorine. 
OK. Now, there are many different ways of defining what electronegativity is. Um, the Pauling um, definition is probably the one that's most commonly used. But again, Dr. Drove will be teaching a couple of others like the All Red Rochow and um, oh, I don't remember the other one. Um, Linus Pauling, interesting man. Um, the first and currently only person to win two Nobel Prizes for two completely different things all by himself. He won the Nobel Prize for chemistry for his uh, contributions to understanding the nature of the chemical bond. And he won the Nobel Peace Prize for his um, work towards nuclear disarmament. Uh, Alyssa, you s raise your hand. Yeah, sorry, I just had a question on the previous slide. Oh, um, my apologies. I was just wondering because I was um, watching the lecture this morning and he was, uh, sorry, Dr. Trant was giving us different rules to follow for resonance structures. Uh -huh. And he just mentioned like, um, like the first one, which is the octet rule. So like more lone pairs means you're less stable. So I just, that's why I thought it was the first one. OK, um, I can't say that I know that rule um, oh. or I've forgotten it. I'm very old and I've not taught this <laughs> but, um, <laughs> lecture course before, so I honestly just couldn't tell you that one. Um, in this case, the electronegativity is actually the main thing. OK, um, I'm sure that there are examples where the rules work. OK. Um, Thank you. Sorry. That's um, OK. <laughs> My first year at university was the year 2000, so um, <laughs> I forget lots of things in the last 21 years. Uh, OK. How do you know when to remove or add hydrogens? Um, ah, OK. Um, Milica, I hope I'm pronouncing that OK. Um, Adding or removing hydrogens in this case, I'm just doing it to show anions and cations. Um, the way that you would know in a reaction would be by understanding some pKa data. Um, so the pKa, the acidity constant, you covered that with, I think, either Dr. Green or Dr. Lee last year, at least the concepts of acidity, and those will continue into the future. You'll probably by the end of this semester be very tired about hearing about pKa's um, because we use them for a lot of things. Acids and bases, but also um, trying to work out what groups are good leaving groups. But I promise that will come along. Um, OK, so electronegativity. Um, the most electronegative is fluorine. Um, Here's a nice little graph of the actual negativities. I thought it was cute from a site called webelements.com. Um, the Pauling definition for electronegativity is essentially all about adding partial charges. OK, so Pauling reasons that the dissociation energy of a purely covalent bond should be the average of the dissociation energies of the homonuclear bonds HA and B, uh, AA and BB. Um, I can go back a slide. Again, I will post these slides or I'll get Dr. Trent to post these slides. This is a rule that I think you learned in first year that when the difference of electronegativity is greater than two, you normally say that um, a compound is ionic. And if it's between 0 0.5 and 2, then we say that it's a polar bond. And if it's less than 0.5, it's purely covalent. Um, oh, yeah, I'll post them with all my scribbles. And if you need to interpret my scribbles because you can't understand them, you can always email me um, as well. Um, so essentially what Pauling was saying is that the bond strength for breaking H and H and the bond strength for breaking, sorry, F and F 
compare that to breaking two HF bonds. OK, so obviously the bond between hydrogen and hydrogen is neutral. The bond between fluorine and fluorine is neutral. But because H and F have different electronegativities, then H is delta positive and F is delta negative. And so with some mathematical trickery, um, Pauling decided that this additional stabilization of the bond was from that positive negative attraction. And the scale of the positive negative attraction is to do with how much an atom wants those electrons. OK, now one thing I really want to emphasize to everyone is the electronegativity is a derived um, property. You know, there is nothing in an atom's makeup that calls it electronegative. It is essentially how much it wants a negative charge. The reason an, that an atom wants a negative charge is because of how much positive charge is in the nucleus, typically. OK. Also, how close to the nucleus an atom has, it stores its negative charge. So if you just look at this as a graph, you can see that fluorine is more electronegative than chlorine. OK, now if we go back to really, really basic dot and cross diagrams. So fluorine. It's got. Two electrons in the first shell. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. In its outer shell, and when you add one more electron, you complete the octet. OK. When you consider chlorine. It's got those two electrons in its core. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then we add an eighth electron. That eighth electron is a lot further from the nucleus than it is for fluorine. OK. It's further away and there is electrons in more electrons in between the nucleus of the atom and the electron that you're throwing in. That means that the effect of the nucleus and the nucleus is where the positive charge is. OK, so the positive charge is what's pulling the negative charge towards it. Very simply, almost all of chemistry, organic, inorganic, whatever, is a plus charge wanting to go near a negative charge. OK, so the further away the negative charge is from the positive charge, the less attractive it's going to be. It's like two magnets. The further away they are from each other, the less they're going to pull on each other. So fluorine is the most electronegative atom. Chlorine has the same electronic configuration, but the electronegativity is lower. There are no kind of like nice linear trends in electronegativity except for the second period elements. These are the only ones that I can ever remember, and that's because it's easy. If you're looking at boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen and fluorine. Boron is boron is 2.0, carbon is 2.5, nitrogen is 3.0, oxygen is 3.5, fluorine is 4.0. And the other one, hydrogen is 2.1. When it comes to it, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen and fluorine are going to cover the majority of your electronegativities. And then hydrogen. 
kills almost all the other bonds. So you can tell that hydrogen is less electronegative than all of these elements, though carbon is the closest. And so it doesn't really count as polar when it's carbon and hydrogen together. We said that an electronegativity difference of less than 0.5 was just normal, non-polar non covalent. So that is a carbon-hydrogen bond. OK. So because of that, if you have something like um, HCl, hydrogen chloride, that's going to be a polar molecule. Where is going to be our partial positive and our partial negative charge? Which one's going to be positive? Which one's going to be negative? Hydrogen or chlorine? CL will be negative, correct. So delta negative. To be honest, in almost every case, exactly, Sarah, yep, high electronegativity. Pretty much every element that you're going to experience in um, organic chemistry, at least, uh, that is not, you know, anything that isn't a metal is going to be more electronegative than hydrogen. And yes, absolutely, hydrogen is going to be positive. But it's always a relative thing. So if we have FCl, oh, class over at 220, my apologies. I'll just conclude with this then. F and chlorine. Got too busy talking about chemistry. Um, I get excitable. Um, is chlorine still going to be the negative one? Fluorine is negative, correct. Everyone's got it. So just remember that when you've got um, hydrogen, it's almost always going to be positive. Fluorine is the most electronegative. And work from there. More electronegative from left to right across the periodic table, less electronegative from bottom, uh, from top to bottom. OK. Um, apparently there's five minutes less than my scheduled meeting time, but uh, I'm willing to call it there. Unless anyone has any particular questions, you are welcome to leave. I'm happy to stick around for another five minutes and answer any questions anyone has. Have a good day as well. <laughs> Anytime. And yes, this will be posted uh, by Dr. Trant. I will give him all the recordings and things. And this is my email in case anyone needs to clarify anything with me. I'm sure Dr. Trank can explain it as well. <laughs>